In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The 11th day of October, and we are celebrating the many wonderful feasts. Every day it's a, it's a, it's a uh, whole collection, a whole array of wonderful saint lives. If we can learn and love to read the Synaxari and the lives of the saints every day, we'll be so benefited in our lives. When you go home, you know, there's six, seven, eight, ten more saints to read about. So I'm only giving you one, just a little snapshot. So by, by all means, take up the Synaxarian in your house and read them because there's so much more to learn. Today we celebrate, especially, first and foremost, in the hierarchy, let's say, or in the, in the Tipagon, we have the ancient apostle Philip from the ancient church, one of the seven deacons. And we're not going to talk about him because I think we did that last year. We're going to look at another saint this year. The second in line is the uh, our Holy Father Theophanes the Graptos, or the Branded, who was a confessor, hymnographer, and bishop of Nicaea, who died in peace. We're going to be speaking about his life today. Also, the Holy Martyr Zinadia and Philonea, the sisters. The Holy Patriarchs Nectarios, Arsakios, and Sicinios of Constantinople, uh, important uh, figures in the Church of Constantinople. Saint Jonah of Pergamos in Cyprus, who was a hermit. St. Philotheos Kokinos, patron of Constantinople. We're going to just touch on his life for a second. And St. Savas of Batopedi, which I think is commemorated on another day. We don't have him in the synagogue, sorry, that I have. Venerable Germanos Marulis the Hagerite. Venerable Ethelberga of Barking, a Western saint. And the Venerable Elders of Optina, who we're also going to talk about briefly. This is the saint of the day that we're going to get, come back to. Give a, give a look at him. <clears throat> He's a, an ascetic and a confessor and um, a hymnographer. But just a word or two about this saint, St. Philotheos Kokinos. Now he lived in the 14th century. Oh, I don't have my timeline here. Oh, just one. Oh, let's see. Well, we're going to have to miss the timeline today. We'll have to come back to that. Uh, but you, we've many times we've showed you the time, and I think you understand the 13th, 14th century. This is this is just before the fall of Constantinople in the 15th century, and he was a very important figure because he he was the patriarch of Constantinople just after the time of Saint Gregory of Palamas. He was a major supporter of Saint Gregory of Palamas and Monathos, who was a very important saint for our theology of what it means to be saved and how we know God and the, the grace of God. Mm -hmm. And he was at the mountain, let's say, at the base of the mountain of the modern life, which, and he gave answers to so many theological and spiritual and philosophical problems that the West was encountering. And this saint, which was his, uh, let's say, major supporter, was the patriarch and was the, was the one who wrote his life. Uh, very important saint. We'll have to come back to him another day. He lived, of course for much of his life on Mount Athos, which we know all about, here at the monastery, at the very peak, at the very bottom of Mount Athos, which is the, uh, the great, great Lavra. We also celebrate the memory today of the Venerable uh, Elders of Optina. Can anybody tell me where Optina is? Our Russian background children here. Optina? Sophia? Never heard of Optina? How about these saints? You ever seen these saints before? Okay, great. That means I can teach you about them, and you can learn more. These are the great elders of the monastery. You want to say, Maria? I think I had an idea in my house, and these are Russian saints. These are Russian elders from a particular monastery. Here is the, here is the image of the monastery in the countryside as it is today. See that? It's a picture taken from across the fields, and you, as you approach Optina. And, and here is another picture of the website. They have a website, and here are the, the elders and pictures of the elders here. Let's see if we can go back and see some of the pictures. So that's the icon. Here's a picture of the first great elder, Leonid, and the second great elder, Makarios, and then the famous Am Ambros, Am Ambrose. He was uh, commemorated yesterday, but we couldn't talk about his life. A really great saint. He's the, he's the image, uh, if when you, some of your older children, you might be reading this book soon, of Fyodor Dostoevsky's novel, The Brothers Karamazov, one of the fam most famous novels ever written. He is the, let's say, the behind, 
behind the image of Zosima, the great elder in the book, is Ambrose in many, in, in, in some ways. He based it on this person who was a contemporary of Dostoevsky. So these are the great elders of Optina, and it's very, there's some other pictures of them. And they were, they were like, when we have, we talk about the elders of Manathos, and we know about Elder Ephraim here, they, um, they were in their day the great line and tradition of, of great elders who counseled and confessed and guided countless souls into the kingdom of God in the Russian uh, land before the coming of the great persecution. And Russia went through great persecution. There were many martyrs, many confessors. And one of the reasons why the church produced so many great martyrs and confessors was because it had been prepared for the martyrdom by the great elders of uh, Russia. And so the same thing happens again and again, and we're going through something similar. We have great elders in our day, and certainly they're preparing us for the confession of the faith, which is to come. Let's go back quickly, because we don't have much time every morning. I want to talk about our saint of the day, Saint Theophanes uh, the Graptos, the Branded who was a confessor during the iconoclast period. I've talked about this with you many times. Somebody has to tell me, among the older kids, about the iconoclast period. Yes? The iconoclast is when uh, people force people, Christians, not to kiss icons. Right. So it was against the icons. They were smashing icons. That's what the word basically means, the destroyers of the icons. Did you want to say something, Eleni? What you just said. Okay. So this is the period in the 7th and 8th centuries, or 8th and 9th centuries, rather, uh, about 100 years in which the emperors had been uh, swayed probably by Islamic or Jewish ideas about uh, God and his ability to be um, depicted. Also, there were excesses, etc. But they turned against them, they destroyed them, and then they destroyed people, or bishops, priests, lay people who resisted that. So it was a terrible time for the church, and uh, this is one of the great confessors during that time. So let's, let's read about his life here. Now, he was born in 778. That's at the end of the 8th century, and uh, I believe we're already in the iconoclast period. And so he is uh, raised uh, by devout parents, uh, instructed their, their children, and sent them, the brother, uh, he and his brother, to the monastery of St. Savas to complete their education. The monastery of St. Savas is in uh, Palestine. So here's a picture of Palestine. Let's see if we can uh, orient ourselves. Do you, do you all see that, in that picture? This is, this is the Middle East. This is where our Lord walked and, and lived here in Jerusalem, not far. This is the the area of the Holy Land, essentially, Palestine. This is where he was born. And the monastery was not far from them. The monastery of St. Sabas, which still exists to this day, and you can go and visit it. Let's see if we can... Um, well, we can't, can't get to that right now, unfortunately, because of the limitations of this iPad. Uh, St. Sabas Monastery in Jerusalem. So he was there. He learned the monastic life, the science of sciences. Uh, we'll go back to the, to the image here. And uh, he and his brother uh, were gifted, were very learned. They were gifted as hymnographers. He was a gift, gifted as an hymnographer. And they were both ordained priests. And right at that time, the emperor Leo the Armenian, in 813, 820, he was the, a major iconoclast emperor who reintroduced and launched a wave of persecution against the venerators of the holy images. He proceeded against Orthodox bishops, and then he abolished all of the sacred images, ordering the destruction of icons and frescoes in the churches. And listen to this. Pay attention to this. This is very interesting. And so you don't think ever that history is just a bunch of events. There is a hand guiding history. Things happen for a reason. There is no accidents. There are no, there's no such thing as luck. When you say, oh, well, that was lucky, no, no, it wasn't. Because nothing is lucky and there's no accidents. There's only providence and things that are allowed by God. And all of it can become salvific if we respond to it with a faithful and humble heart. So listen to this. He abolished the images. He ordered the destruction of the icons and the frescoes in the churches. And his impiety, it says, aroused the anger of God, who allowed the Arabs to invade 
and occupy much of the territory of the empire, including Palestine and the monastery of St. Savas, where our saints were residing. So this is not, it's, it's clear from uh, our teaching and from the synagogue. Sorry, that this was not just, oh, one event and then another event. They are linked, they are connected, and one brought about the other. And God allowed that precisely so that people could be humbled and repent and come back to him so that they might be saved. That's why everything happens that happens under the sun. God allows these things for our salvation. So, this is the state of things. And seeing this, the patriarch of Jerusalem, Thomas, decided to send the two brothers, Theophan and his brother, to Rome and then to Constantinople. And they sent with him a very famous spiritual father, a very famous man, Michael uh, Sinkelis, uh, who's also a saint. And they went on mission to try to convince the emperor of his error. Now listen to this. They're going there for, obviously, for two reasons. Because their whole area has now been run, overrun by Arabs who were not believers. They might have been, I don't know if they were Muslims or not. But they were not believers. And also because this is going to bring even more uh, bad uh, events to the, to the people's lives, the Christians' lives, if there's no repentance. And at first, the emperor was like, oh, these are very interesting people, very bright, very talented. But then, when he saw that he could not win them over, he began to torture and ex torture them, and then he exiled them. He exiled them. He sent them uh, into exile, meaning far away from, from civilization, from people, from the city, so they could no longer be a problem for him. Thankfully, the exile did not last long, for he was assassinated. He was killed and succeeded by Michael II who did not persecute and there was the, the, the Orthodox, even though he did not officially reestablish the veneration of the icons. And then his son, the son of the first Leo came to power and now he became ferocious. He was very angry and wanted even more persecution of the Christians in 829 to 842 and so they were tortured again for their faith. They were brought into the emperor, and they were tortured in front of the empire, emperor. And um, uh, they suffered, it says here, hunger, thirst, mocking, blows, prison, and again exile to an island for the sake of Christ and his holy image. And they were brought before again the emperor, tortured. And then during this, they... During this torture is when they were branded. What does that mean? That means that he took some, he, 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 he had someone uh, create a metal piece, which was very hot and had words on it. And then they put it on his forehead. And these are the words. If you can read the Greek, you've been learning Greek here in the school, but we'll go right to the English for most of us who are still not quite there. And this is the translation of what was branded on their forehead as a, as a sign that they, they were rejected by the emperor and the empire. All long, all, all long to run to the city, Jerusalem, where the all pure feet of God's word stood as a support for the whole world, for the ecumeni. These men were seen in this revered, revered place. And he's now speaking about them in a bad way, right? He's calling them names and things. He says, wicked vessels of superstitious delusion. There, due to unbelief, they did many woeful, shameful, and ungodly-minded things. They were banished from there as apostates. Apostate means that people who have fallen away from what he considers to be the faith. Towards the city, Constantinople, the empire, they fled. They did not abandon their lawless folly. Thus they were branded to be seen as evildoers. They are again condemned and prosecuted. I don't know how they fit that on his forehead, but uh, apparently they did. Uh, it's a lot of words to fit on a forehead. Um, it must have been very small print. Uh, and so this was now for the rest of their lives on their forehead for everyone that encountered them to see these people are uh, enemies of the state, essentially. Think about that a minute now. Think about the, what that means Contemplate the suffering and the long suffering and the patience and the love and the humility of these saints. They they went through this without uh, losing their faith and 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 balking and, and going back. They were exiled to uh, Apamia in Bithynia, part of I think North Eastern Asia Minor and Northwestern Asia Minor, and. Uh, 
there they were amazed, the people were amazed at the love, the perfection, the asceticism, and the love of orthodoxy that these saints maintained. There Theodore, the brother of Theophanes, gave up his soul to God, and then, by God's providence, the persecutions came to an end. Uh, and not before he was banished to Thessaloniki, and there he taught the faithful, and the persecutions came to an end. And he was made uh, the Bishop of Nicaea in 842. Uh, the uh, Patriarch of Constantinople, St. Methodius, consecrated him as Metropolitan. He spent the last years of his life there writing and composing many canons, poetic canons, hymns. So we actually chant in the church hymns written by our saint today. Many of the things we do in the church, you'll, you, if you understand church history and you're standing before the, 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 the books, you'll say, oh, Theophanes. Oh, yes, Theophanes did this, this, this. We know about his life. And he's the one who wrote this hymn that I'm chanting and I'm listening to. See how important it is to know the lives of the saints? And when you enter into the liturgical life, how those go together. How we learn so much about Christ and the church when we know the lives of the saints. Everything, the whole history of the church and the life of the church can be found in the lives of the saints. And that's why we start every day here with them to take inspiration and imitate them. So, let's hear what we need to imitate in the lives of these saints. What are we taking away from this? And how are we going to struggle more to be like Christ? Let's start with um, Elias. Think about it, Elias. Mary? What do you think? What are you getting out of this? Think about it, Mary. Anybody else want to ask any questions or any contributions here? What? Go ahead, Sophia. Like, like what do you mean that they, they put it on, his, on their forehead? Like, so just like they would do to an animal, they do that to the animals, so they know that the, the, they put a number on the animal, they, they sear it into the skin. So it's very painful. It's very painful. Yes, go ahead. Olivia. How do you feel like he was executed? No. No, he died in peace. He was not executed. He died in peace. And, and, and the, the Orthodox faith was reestablished. On the Sunday of Orthodoxy, we commemorate the event of the reestablishment of the icons in 842. And after that event, he was then returned and, and honored as a confessor of the faith. Go ahead. Who died? Uh, well, our saint reposed in peace as a bishop. So that's who we're talking about. Uh -huh. Go ahead, Sophia. Which one died first? The brother, but, but yeah, Theodore. From uh, so in this icon, this is Theodore who died and Theophanes who was, who's our saint of the day. Uh huh. Go ahead. Um, when, when they stack the thing, yes. there's, there, uh, there's a lot of words. There, and uh, if they would be small, you couldn't even read them. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I don't know how they did that. And um, of course, the Greeks less words, right? There's a, if you look at the Greek, there's a lot fewer words in the Greek, right? In, with, no. in Greek, we don't need as many words. Yeah, it's 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 a, it's a bit longer, but it's still pretty amazing. I don't know what to say about that. Maybe there were several places that they they branded him. Maybe it wasn't just in one place. In any case, it was it was a, a sign of their devotion and love of God. God help us to be confessors. God help us to confess Christ. This is what we may all be called to going forward. We started talking about how the elders in Optina were given by God to prepare the people in Russia to be confessors and martyrs. And we're always celebrating confessors and martyrs in the church. This is the lot of the Christian. His life is not given for this world, but to be with God. We're just passing through here. Our, our home is in the heavens, and that's where we're looking. And our whole life is oriented toward being with God eternally. And so when these trials and tribulations come, the Lord said they will. He said, you will have trials and tribulations, but don't be afraid, he says. I have overcome the world. And if you are patient and love me, you will reign with me eternally. And this is why the lives of the saints are so important, because we can easily be distracted and be disillusioned and think that life is about our college education, or about our job, or about uh, whatever we think that we're going to do something and establish something in this world. No, it's not. If you're an Orthodox Christian, your life is not about what you're doing, but who you are becoming. It's not about what you're doing, it's about who you're becoming. And we want to become like the saints. 
to the prayers of our Holy Father, that you'll find with Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, 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 have mercy. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy. Jesus Christ, have mercy. Jesus Christ, have mercy. Jesus Christ, have mercy. Jesus Christ, have mercy.